Good evening. My name is Seth Norton. I'm the director of the J. Dennis Hastert Center for Economics, Government, and Public Policy at Wheaton College. Delightful that you are here for an address tonight on priorities in reforming public education and economic perspective. Our speaker is Diane Whitmore Schatzenbach. Diane is associate professor at the School of Education and Social Policy at Northwestern University. She has a courtesy appointment in the Department of Economics there as well. She's a faculty fellow at the Institute of Policy, for Policy Research, a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic <coughs> Research, and visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, a faculty affiliate at the Institute of Research, excuse me, the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin. Formerly, she was assistant professor at the Harris Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago, a scholar in health policy research, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, University of California, Berkeley. Professor Schatzenbach holds a BA magna cum laude from, in economics and religion from Wellesley College, an MA and PhD in economics from Princeton University. She's published widely in economics of education, public policy, health, and poverty. Interesting phenomenon. The second half of the 20th century, economists became fascinated with the economics of education, realizing the power of education in enhancing economic growth and human well-being. In recent decades, economists have turned much attention to assessing educational policies and policy reforms. Our speaker tonight has been at the forefront of this movement within economics. So let's give Professor Schanzenbeck a warm Wheaton welcome. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. So yeah, and thank you for that nice introduction. I really think that the topic that I'm gonna talk about here today, that reforming public education is one of the most pressing moral issues of our time today. Uh, the fact that so many low-income children uh, are disadvantaged so much by not uh, having access to high-quality education, I think is something that we should be gravely concerned about. So let me um, start by giving you a little bit of background information. Uh, first, many of you know, uh, certainly people who are actually in college know that education is a very important path to obtaining a high income job. So uh, you can see here the bar chart uh, reflects average or sort of median income in thousands across education levels. And what you can see is you know, people with college degrees and advanced degrees earn substantially more than people who are high school graduates or high school dropouts. Pressing forward, we can see that there are large income gaps in college graduation rates, and those have been growing over time. So on the left-hand side here, we can see that in 1975 through 78, um, low-income college graduation rates were about 5%, um, and high-income graduation rates were about 36%. We've seen, overall, lots more people graduate from college today, and so that's uh, what you see on the right here, 93 to 96. Um, you know, today over half of high-income kids graduate from college, uh, but the number for low-income kids has um, been relatively stagnant. So we think that one of the primary reasons that people with more or higher levels of education make more money in the job market is because they have higher skills. And so really what, uh, what I like to think about uh, when we think about education reform is how to make sure that kids have access to high-quality skills. Uh, so just a little bit about uh, background on sort of the trends in recent years of um, skill attainment. This is evidence from the National um, Assessment of Education Progress. It's the one national standardized test uh, that we currently have, and it's only given to a subset of, of students. And this is what trends in reading scores look like for nine-year-olds um, over the last uh, 40 or so years. And what you can see is um, the top line here is for white students and you can see um, things have been relatively flat over the last 30 or 40 years, um, although there's been sort of an uptick in the last couple of years. Um, 
African Americans and Hispanics are the two lines below. And you can see that there has been um, you know, stronger increase in skill levels uh, for African Americans and Hispanics, but there are still large gaps. Uh, this is what the same picture looks like for math. Again, you can see sort of an upward trend in skills, and I think a lot of people don't know that. Um, a lot of people are unaware that uh, test scores have improved over the last 10 or 15 years or so, but large gaps persist. Uh, next here I'm showing you uh, the black-white achievement gap and the Hispanic-white achievement, achievement gap um, in math for nine-year-olds. What you can see is, uh, there has been some progress, the um, sort of lower means that there's a, a less of a black-white achievement gap or, or less of a Hispanic-white achievement gap. But basically the progress in this has more or less stalled in terms of closing uh, the achievement gap, especially in math. So as an economist, I like to think about um, schools and school reforms uh, just like we think about sort of producing all other goods and service services. Oh no. So I'm. Sorry to say that it looks like sort of a lot of my um, slides got a little, um, I think, messed up is the, um, is the term, but we'll sort of cope with it as, as, best, as best as we can. You know, so whenever we produce anything like a car or something like that, uh, you know, we think about uh, inputs. And in education production, we think of inputs being broken into two different sets of groups. Uh, the first is school-based inputs, and this would include things like the amount of time spent in school, the quality of teaching, the, and these are typically things that we can manipulate with public policy. On the other hand, we can also think about home-based inputs, and home-based inputs are actually the most important determinants of skill acquisition. Uh, and we can think about that of quantifying those in various ways. Um, for example, the amount and quality of parental time. And there's a lot of evidence that for low-income kids, the amount of time that they spend with their parents and the quality of that as measured by different, different metrics are, um, are lower quality. Uh, in addition, income sure seems to be causally related to academic achievement, and of course, low-income kids have, have less of that also. Uh, these home-based inputs are relatively harder for us to manipulate with public policy. That said, I wanted to spend a minute talking a little bit more about home-based inputs and how those vary across um, high and low SES kids, uh, because I think even though we can't affect these nearly um, as uh, quickly with public policy, it's certainly something that the church should be talking about and thinking about quite a bit. So many of you uh, may have heard of this uh, famous Hart and Risley study in the past. What this study did was follow low-income, middle-income, and high-income kids um, over the course of their day and chart their interactions with their parents. One of the most striking discoveries from this, this study was that just the sheer number of words that low-income children hear in an hour or in a day is about one-third of the level of words heard by high-income kids. Furthermore, they find that um, there's a large variation in the amount of time that high SES parents spend interacting with their children, even when they're to together than low SES uh, parents. Furthermore, there are strong differences um, in the likelihood of expressing approval or encouragement. Uh, high SES kids, the words they hear are much more likely to be encouraging, and there are just many more of them. So when you aggregate this up until age three, the gap in the number of words heard between a high SES kid and a low SES kid is 30 million word difference. Right, so these are experiencing very different childhoods, although just only up to age three. And you can imagine that over time, it should, the gaps just get larger and larger. They have, uh, the studies have shown that this is highly predictive of a child's future vocabulary and even her IQ. Thinking more about differences in family structures uh, across different socioeconomic groups, uh, we see today that African Americans are much less likely to live in a two-parent family, uh, certainly than white children, and much less likely uh, today than they were in 1960. So you can see here, uh, the bar graph indicates that 
79% of white children today live with, in a two-parent family compared to 33% of African-American uh, children who live in a two-parent family. Uh, we know that two parents are better than one parent uh, when it comes to uh, producing education and lots of other things too. Even though kids are coming to school with starkly different backgrounds, uh, I think as Americans we think that uh, it's really important that our uh, schools try to overcome these differences in backgrounds. So this is a quote uh, from Arnie Duncan, the current Secretary of Education, uh, from just a few weeks ago, where he says, zip code, race, disability, and family income should not limit students' opportunities or reduce the expectations for them. And in fact, uh, George Bush, when he introduced the No Child Left Behind Act, really you know, uh, said a lot of the same things. The two overarching goals of the No Child Left Behind Act were to raise achievement levels overall and to reduce the achievement gap between black and white, between rich and poor, and so on. So I'm here today to give an overview of how economists think about those policies, policies that are intended to raise the overall achievement level and to close the achievement gap. So I'll go through, uh, I'm very sad that these uh, slides that I've worked so hard on have sort of lost all of their formatting, but what can you do? Uh, so historically, uh, you know, economists think about inputs uh, and a good way to measure inputs is how much money do you spend. This has been sort of the main lever for improving schools, you know, more or less over the last hundred or so years. And there are lots of reasons why we think we need to spend more on education today than we used to have to spend. For example, uh, there's been real wage growth among college graduates, and since teachers have to be college graduates, that means we have to sort of keep up with their next best option in terms of their job. So teachers are paid more than they used to be, um, although less when compared to other college graduates. But so that's driving up the cost on some level. Um, furthermore, we're uh, committed more as a society today to um, mainstreaming and uh, taking care of children in special education. So we've increased the spending on special education. We've also seen a decline in average class sizes over the last 40 or so years. There's been some ups and downs around that, but generally uh, things have been, have been going down. So when we think about um, spending on schools, I want to remind you that most of education spending is from the state and local governments. The federal government pays a relatively small, plays a relatively small role in this. Uh, so there are two sort of main sources of thinking about uh, ways that we've increased school spending. The first is from the feds, and that's uh, Title I, which was introduced in 1965, which is providing federal dollars to schools with high percentages of low-income children. So most of the federal spending that goes to instruction comes through this program, and it only comprises about 10% of overall education spending. 90%, the vast majority, comes from state and local sources. And if we think about sort of other things that have uh, driven up state and local spending, um, a lot of that variation has come from school level finance reforms, sorry, state level finance reforms, um, sort of kicked off by the, the Serrano versus Priest uh, Supreme Court decision uh, in California in 1971, uh, where they w wanted to move toward more equity in school spending and redistribute within, within the states. So we've seen over time large increases in educational spending. And so the top line here shows the increase in per pupil spending in inflation adjusted dollars. And what you can see here is, you know, over this time period from 1970 to about 2010, um, real per pupil spending has more than doubled. You might remember that when I showed you the test score trends, the test scores have not essentially doubled over the last 40 years. So this um, has led lots of, especially economists, to uh, question, does money matter? So there's a whole does money matter literature uh, that I'm just going to sort of gloss over. And in fact, um, a lot of what I'm going to do tonight is sort of give you my summary of these vast literatures that I have been um, working in and teaching in and so on over the last decade or so. So this does money matter literature, uh, you know, sort of is really based on the idea that, well, 
there's been this tremendous increase in spending, and it has not clearly led to better student performance. Now, I will say that some careful studies uh, that have uh, been done of Title I spending or state finance reforms have documented that there are some improvements from funding in increases. But I would say that there's today a general agreement among policymakers that just throwing money at the problem is not going to yield a very large return when it comes to increasing test score performance. So that sort of makes us want to move on and try to figure out, well, what's a better approach here? Uh, and so we can sort of branch off on two additional routes. The first is to still can, uh, provide more income, but to target those funds towards more specific inputs and not just give a blank check, or improve, uh, introduce market discipline. And we'll talk about each of those in turn. So the first, targeting funds towards specific in inputs, uh, we can think about the move towards reducing class size. So instead of just giving people a blank check, we say we give you this blank check that actually isn't blank. You have to use it to, to reduce class size. Most of what we know about the impact of class size reduction uh, was known from a very famous study that was conducted in Tennessee uh, in the, the mid-1980s called Project STAR. In this experiment, children within schools were randomized to either be in a small class or a regular size class. Teachers were also randomly assigned. And the evidence is that when children were randomly assigned to smaller classes, they outscored their schoolmates who were in regular size classes substantially. So what this shows is uh, three sets of bar charts uh, overall students on free lunch and African-American students. And this shows the difference in test scores um, is measured in standard deviation units. So you could think about this uh, point two as about a five percentage point increase in test scores. You can see in kindergarten and first grade, uh, there's on average a five percentage point increase in test score attainment. And that fades a little bit in second and third grade, but it's still substantial. These are highly statistically significant and meaningful. Because the, uh, the randomized controlled experiment that was conducted in Tennessee in the mid-1980s uh, was so unusual, uh, the literature has done a lot to follow up on, uh, on these students. And in fact, some of my dissertation work uh, was, was, uh, was on this, this exact experiment. What we found is that not only do smaller classes improve student outcomes relative to the children who are randomly assigned to the control group while they were in those small classes, but the benefits continue to pay off years later. So uh, they're more likely to graduate from college. Uh, they're more likely to perform better on a variety of life outcomes like earnings and home ownership and marriage rates and so on uh, that are measured in their late 20s. This is especially the case throughout this experiment for low-income children. So we see sort of repeatedly that when we invest more in low-income children, there's sort of a bigger bang, bang for the buck. Uh, there are lots of reasons to think that class size reduction, small classes are uh, sort of a, a worthy policy intervention. For one, it's, it's quite popular, popular with teachers, popular with parents. Uh, but on the other hand, it is um, relatively expensive. Oh, hey, look, did you fix that? Thank you. Good job. Um, it's a blunt policy tool. Um, it's not directly tied to improving instructional quality, and it's relatively expensive. It's extremely expensive. And the best evidence is the benefits outweigh the costs. Nonetheless, uh, you know, we're in tight budgetary times. We probably want to try to figure out where do we get the biggest bang for our buck. So I would argue that I think the literature and the policymakers have really switched to let's focus on how do we best improve teaching quality as experienced by kids overall and especially these low income kids. So what the literature has uncovered in the last uh, five to ten years is that there are very large differences in the instructional quality of teachers. Now, many of you who are in the education school will giggle about that because you're like, really? That you had to discover that? Yes, yes, yes. But we did have to discover that. And so what we see is um, there are very large differences that are stable across teachers um, in terms of the level of gains in test scores that they impart to their students. And so uh, if we put, <laughs> all right, well, you're messing around with me now. Um, 
if we put some dollar figures on this, we can say that if we rank all the teachers and we, t we move you from the 33rd percentile of teacher instructional quality to the 67th percentile, that's a two standard deviation improvement, um, your test scores are gonna go up by about five percentage points, about 0.2 standard deviations. And we can translate that into dollar figures. Um, and in terms of dollars, that's um, about $50,000 per student in additional lifetime earnings. Okay, so if you multiply that up by a classroom of 20, replacing that below average, but not terrible teacher with a high, or with an above average, but not amazing teacher, um, increases our national earnings by a million dollars because of that additional skills that were imparted to these kids. Now, importantly, the variation in teacher quality is not well predicted by the standard things that we uh, usually use to reward teachers, like their experience level and their education level. Uh, and in uh, fact, uh, I wanted to point out that uh, you know, this was uh, my work on this, which I think sort of was one of the seminal papers in this area, where we, uh, you, many of you may have seen this, it was ran on the front page of the New York Times, uh, called the case for $320,000 kindergarten teachers, where we sort of first costed out the benefits of having higher quality um, kindergarten teachers. Subsequent evidence suggests that it's not just kindergarten teachers who can make a world of difference. So I could um, sort of go on at length and I'd be happy to answer more questions about the teacher quality literature, but I think that there are just a, a few takeaways that I want to underscore for you right now. First, and arguably most importantly, um, it is important that we can say, you know, science has proven that individual teachers can make a lifetime impact on their students. And that's another thing where you think, really, you needed a, you know, a study to show that? It's long been known that a good teacher can make a big difference in their students' lives. We can all look back and think about teachers that we had that really changed our lives. But what's important is this literature measures it and proves it. Uh, and you know, sort of documents that there's real money attached to this. So that's point one. Point two in the teacher quality literature is that the impact on lifetime earnings is not exclusively mediated through the increase in test scores. So uh, we think that good teachers not only teach content, but they also teach these other things, like what we call non-cognitive skills in economics. Right? So that's this notion of grit that we've been hearing a lot about recently. It's the ability to get along with others and finish tasks, and so on and so forth. There's a big payoff to that uh, in the real world, and uh, people who can teach that uh, make their students a lot better off. Now importantly, uh, the Gates Foundation recently uh, released a study, a very expensive study, uh, where they looked to see are the teachers who can raise test scores the same teachers that can um, increase deeper levels of learning. And those two things are positively correlated with one another, but they're not perfectly correlated with one another. And so whenever we think about trying to uh, you know, really retain and fire teachers based on their test score value added, because of this work from the Gates Foundation, I think we've learned that we can't let that be the only factor. Of course, common sense would tell us that shouldn't be the only factor also, but uh, there's more to teaching, of course, that gets measured easily in standardized test. And then the third takeaway from the teacher quality literature is that on average, although there is a distribution, the quality of teaching experienced by low-income students is lower than teachers that teach high-income students. So that, you know, now that we sort of know a little bit more about how important teachers are, many of you knew that already, but I've at least, you know, measured it for you. We can sort of turn back to our question about, well, how do we improve education? And in particular, are there better targeted policies out there than class size reduction that will enable us to improve the teaching that's experienced by low-income children? And in particular, as an economist, my first question is always, can market-based policies improve the teaching experienced by poor children? And as an economist, thinking about market-based structures, there are two that I turn to. The first is accountability, and that is the uh, federal policy, no child left behind. And the second is competition, or school choice. 
So let me first uh, give you a little bit of background about um, the accountability landscape in the United States. I think a lot of people have heard of No Child Left Behind. Many of you probably are great experts at it. But for those of you who are maybe a little less wonky on this, let me give you the quick overview. So under No Child Left Behind, students take state exams in math and reading, and they take those across grades three through eight. States themselves get to decide what, is, what score level is passing and what score level is failing. States then also get to set their target passing rates, and uh, they started setting those in 2004, and they were required to ratchet up over time until now, in 2014, 100% of all children in the United States are required to be proficient. Uh, I, I, it didn't work. Uh, they, but the states had some discretion in the intermediate years about sort of how high, you know, how high, quickly do we ratchet this up. Importantly, from an economic perspective, schools are also required to publicly report passing rates on these tests, not only overall, but also by certain, by all the numerically significant subgroups in the school. So this provides parents and other people information that they badly need about you know, what's going on in, in the school. The schools then are sanctioned if any of their subgroups fail to pass the goal for any of, uh, any of the, the tests. So that is, any subgroup is defined by race, economically disadvantaged, disability, um, fails. The school fails. There is some wiggle room, there's a safe harbor provision and so on, but that's a little, uh, we can talk about that later. And the penalties escalate over time. And so at the end of seven years of consistent failure to meet the benchmarks for even just one of the, of the subgroups, uh, schools were, were supposed to face closure or restructuring by year seven. Now we backed off of that in large part, but this was the, what was the original uh, law said. And the theory of change that's really going on around accountability is that we think that teachers can work more effectively with the current resources that they already have if we just tinker around with the incentives. What we found was, um, in fact, schools are responding to these incentives. And this was news to uh, the education research literature because the old conventional wisdom really was that schools don't respond to incentives, that we're sort of immune to that for some reason. But the new conventional wisdom, I would argue, is that um, math, and, uh, math achievement and proficiency rates especially have increased because of no child left behind. And I, um, throughout this, I have sort of the canonical sites um, listed there. So there's an important paper by uh, Brian Jacob and Tom D on this. What we find is uh, math achievement especially goes up for disadvantaged students. And in fact, uh, that's what this bar graph shows. Um, this is the increase in math achievement, again, in standard deviation units. So you can think of, uh, you know, essentially this, uh, the largest bar there uh, for African Americans, that's almost 50%. That would essentially reduce the black-white achievement gap by half. So you can see large improvements in math scores in fourth grade, slightly muted in eighth grade, and certainly larger for uh, African Americans and Hispanics. Now, the bad news is we're not able to measure any positive impact, at least not nationwide, on, on reading test scores. But certainly math scores have gone up um, in response to this. We've seen uh, that schools are responding to these incentives in a couple of ways. First, by changing what they teach. So there's tons and tons of literature out there on sort of uh, individual school districts or individual states and sort of what they do differently because of No Child Left Behind. And so we've seen that uh, effort is redirected toward high stakes subjects and tested grades. We also found that effort has been directed away from non-tested subjects like science, like social studies, or sort of these you know, vague non-cognitive skills that don't directly show up on, on the standardized test. Furthermore, schools change to whom they are directing their teacher, teaching. So there's been a documentation of some strategic assignment to special ed status or ELL status. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the bubble students. Uh, on the next slide, and the third way that schools have been 
responding to incentives is by redefining what it means to be proficient. So let me start off uh, by talking about the bubble students or what we term educational triage. And this is work that I have done with my friend Derek Neal at the University of Chicago. So as I mentioned, in the incentives in most states are that only passing the test or failing the test matters. You get no credit for moving a student's test score up unless they cross that magic threshold of passing or failing. So we've got this model that suggests you know, how teachers are allocating sort of the extra attention that they're able to give to certain, certain students. And this is relatively straightforwardly explained um, with this little diagram that I'll put up. So let's imagine we've got um, students lined up against, along this line uh, by their test score when they enter the, the grade. Uh, from zero, which is the bottom, to 100% um, at the top. And the passing score is uh, denoted by this, this dotted line. So what we know is there's a large fraction of children that they're going to pass essentially no matter what. And there's some fraction of children, depending on where we set this bar, that are probably going to fail almost no matter what. And then there are some kids in the middle that with the right coaching, the right extra attention, the right instruction, uh, we can move them over the passing threshold. So there's evidence uh, that schools got this, got this very quickly, and really directed their attention toward these kids that are right on the threshold of passing. This is sort of the um, summary slide from my work with Derek Neal on this uh, that looks at, you know, on the x-axis is um, the decile of achievement that a student had at the beginning of the year, and then the bars represent the gains that they made relative to a control group that wasn't exposed to the same high stakes testing. And what you can see is, um, there are lots of gains, and those gains um, do not extend to the bottom of the distribution. Right? So we are seeing those improvements in test scores, but those improvements in test scores are really running from uh, the third decile to the seventh or eighth. In this example, it goes all the way up to the tenth. In other cuts of the data, the kids at the very top are also not helped by this. Um, but here you can certainly see that the kids at the bottom, uh, those bars are going the wrong way. Their scores are not improving they're getting worse. There's some really nice uh, qualitative studies about what happens in the classroom as a result of accountability policy. Um, this is a quote from uh, Jen Jennings' uh, study of Texas school teachers after they introduced their uh, their accountability policy, and I'll just read it. Um, she's interviewing a teacher who says, you've got to figure out who to focus on in class. If you look at her pointing to a student's score on her class's summary sheet, she's got a 25%. What's the point in trying to get her to grade level? It would take two years to get her to pass the test, so there's really no hope for her. I feel like we might as well focus on the ones that there's hope for. Right? We don't want incentives in the US school system that says, let's give up hope on some kids because we're not going to get them to pass this year. Do we? The other way that states in particular have responded to this is by setting relatively low standards. So what this graph shows uh, is measures of proficiency rates across two different measures. On the x-axis here, it's the percent of students that are pa passing the state's own proficiency bar. On the y-axis, it's the uh, percent that are passing the US proficiency bar according to the NAEP test, which again is only given to a subset of students. I drew the 45-degree uh, line there in red, and so you can see if states were setting the same standards as the feds, everybody would be lined up along, uh, along that 45 degree line. Uh, you can see that that's, that's not how this goes, and there are lots of states. Um, you know, we could call out the ones on, on the end here, like North Carolina, Texas, Tennessee, Mississippi, that at the time uh, had set such low standards uh, that it looked like many of their children were passing, but when sort of judging all the states by the same yardstick, they were not. So recall that No Child Left Behind was um, introduced with 
you know, a lot of very um, lofty rhetoric, right? So if you remember George W. Bush's speech where he said, um, you know, that we don't want to expose children to the soft bigotry of low expectations. But of course, the incentives in this policy have said, well, maybe we can lower the expectations because if everybody has to get over the hump uh, and we're gonna get in trouble if you don't, uh, we need, something needs to give. Now I will say that the Common Core and the Race to the Top um, are attempting to raise standards. This has been a recognized problem and uh, arguably we're trying to do something about it now. So if we think about the next steps and how do we improve the accountability system in the United States today, of course the first step is to reauthorize the No Child Left Behind Act. It's called the ESEA. It was supposed to be reauthorized in 2007, but many of us are aware that Washington isn't really into getting things done these days. Um, but maybe it would be a good idea uh, if they tried that. Um, you know, so as we think about what should we do to reauthorize this this law, I think it's really important that we hold to the ideals that there's accountability for all students and transparency so that parents can know, is my school doing a good job or not? But we also need to improve incentives, right? So it, uh, in particular, that would involve giving rewards for progress all throughout the distribution so we don't say that that girl who's got the 25 score is a hopeless case this year. Uh, we need to be sure to set worthy goals that are rigorous and also broad, that we don't just concentrate on math and reading, but recognize that education is, reading and math is really important in education, but there's more to it than that. And then I would argue that, you know, if we're going to uh, dismiss principles and hold principles accountable for making sure that her school has a high passing rate, she needs to have some sort of a power to uh, control the purse strings more uh, reasonably than, than she has now. Um, finally, oh, oh, we're just going all over the place. Sorry. I think I'm, I don't know, who knows what's going on. So finally, I think that we are at a point now, I'm just gonna keep running through this, where we've sort of squeezed all we can out of the lemon of um, just improve um, incentives and we can get enough done with the resources we always already have. And we want to um, start thinking about uh, whether we need to sort of infuse more resources into this system. Uh, in particular, thinking about more money, uh, better teacher coaching, or uh, you know, more demanding curriculums. So just briefly, um, I wouldn't be an economist if I didn't talk a little bit about how school competition fig figures in to this. And I want to um, draw distinctions here. I think there's sort of two different models for competition. The first is uh, what it looks like in the suburbs, right? And this, um, I'll give the brief overview. Um, when we think about suburban living, families are making their decisions about where to live based on the uh, mix of amenities that different suburbs offer. So that includes the park district, the quality of the roads, quality of the schools, et cetera. School quality is a really important part of this. And localities, therefore, are going to compete to offer better mixes of amenities. Um, this is called TBU competition in economics, and there's a whole literature on this. But basically, it sort of asks the question, you know, do I want to live in Wheaton? Do I want to live in Glen Ellen? How do I make that decision? What all goes into that? And uh, you're pretty sure that both of those suburbs are making sure that their schools are pretty good, so really good, um, so that uh, people are, are drawn to them. In the suburbs, there is limited scope for private schools or charter schools to exert major competitive pressure on this. Really, we think the competition that's going on is between localities. And so my argument, uh, sort of based on this literature, is that the best policy, really, for the suburbs is to make sure that information is available to parents and that there's plenty of local controls and sort of let the parents uh, butt in as much as they feel like they need to. Um, that's, that's working for us in Wilmette, uh, to the principal's chagrin sometimes. Um, on the other hand, when we think about cities, there's a much higher density of students, and we're better able to break the tie between residential education and school that's attended. And so, in this case, um, 
school choice sort of seems to work a little bit more effectively. So charters and private schools are in closer proximity and they can compete a little bit more vigorously. So a lot of people are very interested in charter schools and want to know, are, is that our silver bullet here? And I will say as an economist, we really do think strongly based on our theories that choice is better. But I'll say that there's strikingly mixed empirical results on the impact of charter schools. Now, I will also say that it's hard to identify the cause and effect relationship of attending a particular school. And so, you know, the, you know leave that, you know, I guess to the, um, to the scholars and we fight quite a bit about is this um, a good study or is this a good study or so on. But in order for the school choice to lift all boats, which is sort of the model that we have in mind, that because of uh, competition, the bad schools are either gonna be forced to improve or they're gonna go out of business, the threat of competition has to be pretty large, large enough. And what we find uh, in cities that have introduced lots of charter schools is what I would argue is a pretty modest overall effect. But that probably conflates the fact that there are several many poor or mediocre charter schools and many good or excellent charter schools. And when you have bad ones and you have good ones and you call them all the same thing, on average you get something that looks like a zero. I will point out that there's really good evidence of some truly exceptional charter schools. I'll call out in Chicago the University of Chicago Charter Schools Network. There was a randomized control study that found impacts of attending the school for a year that will cut the black-white achievement gap in half. The literature points to other examples of uh, these sort of miracle working charter schools um, in the form of what has been come to, come to known as, be known as uh, no excuses charter schools. So these are characterized by uh, demanding curricula, you know, very rigorous discipline and so on. So these are things like the KIPP schools, the Harlem Children's Zones, the kind of schools that were uh, profiled in Waiting for Superman. Um, my takeaway, and again, we can talk more about this in the question and answer, is that charter schools hold some promise in very densely populated urban areas. And it probably is only going to make a big difference for the re reasonably motivated children and families who are willing to go to these highly demanding charter schools and stick it out. In fact, just this week, there was a front page article in the Chicago Tribune about the harsh discipline policies um, employed in some of these schools. And uh, you know there were interviews on both sides of the issue. Some parents that said it was the best thing that's ever happened to my son. Other parents that said, you know, get us out of here uh, and we'll move on. So it's not gonna be the silver bullet that sol solves everything, but it's sure gonna be a path to college and to higher paying jobs for many kids. So just to finish up um, about some other policies that are promising, you know, generally I think we're looking for policies that are going to attract and retain good teachers. Uh, Teach for America I think has done some good. I don't think it's the panacea either. Um, incentive payments for teachers I think holds some promise. Um, the evidence so far is mixed and the details are really going to matter on that. Another policy that we're talking about a lot right now in this nation is the expansion of preschool. This is actually what my current work is on. And so I will sort of summarize thinking about preschool in uh, sort of these two bullet points. The first is the, the impact of attending preschool really depends on the degree to which the preschool improves the environment that the child ex in, uh, exists in. As a result, there's a very large payoff to starting a high quality targeted preschool program, but the payoff decreases dramatically as uh, the eligibility expands. And we can, again, if people have questions about that, I'm happy to take them um, during question and answer. But overall, I think my takeaways from this evening's talks um, are, are the following four points. The first is when we think about improving public education, we really need to focus on outputs. We need to judge a school by the learning that it produces and not by blunt proxy measures like spending per student. The second is that incentives really matter. Um, we saw that scores improved because of no child left behind, but we also saw that there were important unintended consequences because schools respond not only to good incentives but also to bad incentives. Uh, and so we've talked a little bit about ways to improve those incentives. Next, 
I would argue that it is hard to have a robust and thriving accountability policy uh, if nobody has responsibility. So what we're doing is asking principals primarily to improve the efficiency with which their schools run, but we're not giving them much flexibility on the main determinants of that efficiency, which is the terms of employment and merit-based rewards for uh, her employees, the teachers. And so finally, you know, any time that we're reforming public education, it's going to be politically hard to do because there are lots of actors who are entrenched and have, you know, high stakes sort of on both sides of this. So any sort of reform, uh, you know, requires buy-in from uh, unions and the uh, tenured teachers uh, and so on. So with that, I'd love to open it up for questions. Let me give you the script, so to speak, as to the questions. What we'd like you to do, if you have questions, you have three by five cards on your uh, chairs. If you would fill out a question and pass it to the end of the aisle, we will have people who are willing to collect them. Also, I'd like you to fill out the evaluation forms for this session, if you would. And finally, I would like to ask a couple questions while you're filling out those forms. So. Here's question number one. Seems like families count, teachers count. I'm curious. I've seen some great motion pictures that had fabulous principles that revolutionized the cosmos for just one little school. Do principles count? Oh, principles for sure count. Um, we just have we have fewer studies on them. Uh, I think people are. Uh, Academics, uh, researchers are just beginning to understand how much principles matter. But whenever you talk to people who are actually in education, um, especially trying to reform, for example, the Chicago Public Schools, they are, keep focusing on leadership, leadership, leadership. We need to do a better job of training our leaders and so on. So for sure, principles matter. And at least from the sort of quantitative economics standpoint, we don't know uh, yet how much and we don't know what to do. Okay, fair enough. Let me ask you another one. I think I'm roughly quoting or paraphrasing or something like this, Mark Twain. But he said, in the first place, God made idiots. This was for practice. Then he made school boards. <laughs> Do school boards count? That's a great question, um, and they must. Um, I think that is not something that we have a ton of, of evidence on in terms of this sort of quantitative economic uh, work that I, I am doing. You, certainly uh, state school superintendents count, um, and I think it's almost certain that local school boards count, but uh, I don't think we know, again, how much or why. Could have a little Tebow effect there as for well. For sure, for yeah. sure. That could be the difference between Glen Ellen and Wheaton is, you know. A few other things as well. Okay, here's a. Oh, and there's lots. Well, I had a couple more. They were real humdingers, but uh, I will move on <laughs> and, and get to the audience. Struggle with my poor reading ability. If we cannot affect home-based inputs through policy, is there a possibility to encourage proxies for home-based inputs through policy? E.g., after-school programs at church, nonprofit tutoring programs such as Jumpstart. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm not just saying that we can't affect home inputs at all through policy. It's just a lot harder. But absolutely, uh, sort of these wraparound programs uh, are doing great work. There's tons of good evidence. Uh, you know, I didn't really talk about it, but tons of evidence, uh, you know, that you know, as we say, they are doing the Lord's work. This is twofold. A, do you support the Common Core initiative? Can you read me B too? I might hedge my answer. Here's B. Is school policies set together by the federal government or better, excuse me, it must be better, 
uh, by the federal government or better at the state and local level? Yeah, no, so uh, in thinking about Common Core, I think that the, the idea behind it is a really good one, right? So the idea is we don't want this race to the bottom and to make sure that the standards are super low. We want to have lofty goals. Now, I do think that it's a reasonable question about, you know, in the United States of America, do we want the federal government to be setting those lofty goals or do we want to be leaving that, like we have done historically to states and localities to do? Um, I think a lot of people are, you know, think, you know, they're relatively impressed with the Common Core, although I, uh, I think there are bugs to be worked out. So that, but overall, I think your point is, or the point of the question is, is well taken, that this has historically been a state and local situation, uh, and even No Child Left Behind was trying to preserve a lot of that state and local autonomy by allowing the states to decide what's your test, what's the passing threshold, and so on. And I think that that's really important and we don't want to see that go away in the United States. Thank you. A group of economists, including Stephen Levitt, proposed offering bonuses to teachers up front, then, take, then taking the bonuses away if the students didn't achieve adequate test scores. What are your thoughts on this compensation? Is there a more effective bonus program? So many of you maybe have heard this. It sort of got some play because, you know, he's the author of Freakonomics. And, uh, you know, we're trying to figure out, I think, as a society, what's the best way to provide incentives to teachers to sort of put in that extra effort. And they found some evidence that uh, giving the money up front and then saying, but if you don't do as well as we wanted you to do, we're going to take it back, um, that that really stressed out the teachers and made them uh, more effective. I, I um, have a hard time imagining that in, you know, in policy in real life. That just seemed um, pretend cute. Um, you know, and you know, there's good psychological reasons behind that. It's called, um, you know, loss aversion. Um, and you know, so I see why they wanted to uh, to study it, but I don't think that that's going to be uh, the incentive uh, scheme that that ends up working. Thank you. Why aren't the ta aren't the Talent Act and Javits a higher priority? I don't even know what that is. Neither do I. Okay. <laughs> Um, you said I know a lot about policy. <laughs> you said parents' control is important. However, with Common Core, parents have little say over what's taught. How do you handle this? How do we handle this? Well, I mean, I think that that's the, uh, that's the discussion uh, that we need to be having right now. And I think as more states are pulling away from Common Core towards more state-level control, uh, we're going to have more and more of, of those conversations. So I, I, I'm sympathetic to that, that question, but I do not have an answer. Will the girl who got the 25% be admitted to a charter school? Yes. Yes. Um, and, you know, and that's one of the things about uh, charter schools uh, is uh, you know, there's this notion that they're doing a lot of cream skimming, and they are doing some cream skimming because they're making it sort of very rigorous to stay in, and so sort of the weak kind of leave and so go back to the regular system. But a lot of the evidence of sort of the miracles that the really high quality ones are working, they're doing with sort of the least of these. Thank you. How do you measure non-cognitive skills, i.e. grit? Well, Angela Duckworth, the sort of inventor of grit, has uh, you know has these measures of, of that. Uh, you in the literature, it's measured in various ways. I think one of the one of the questions is you know can we add that to an accountability framework? Can we you know provide incentives for stuff like that? And I think that um, we're working on it, but it's it's actually really hard to figure out how do we measure non-cognitive skills in a manner that we can, you know, say, you need to also make sure that you're producing these, not just math and reading test scores. And that's sort of the next, uh, and one of the next big challenges. Thank you. He's, he's keeping me on task. I could ramble on all of these for half an hour. Does any of your work deal with analyzing curriculum structure and the effect on education of, and quality effects? 
Yeah, uh, you know, so I'm familiar with some of the literature mostly on what happens when we increase the rigor of a curriculum. So for example, if we require uh, more math classes in order to graduate from high school. And I think the evidence is uh, that does two things, and this shouldn't surprise anyone. The kids that are on the margin of dropping out versus not dropping out are now more likely to drop out because they can't hack those last couple of math classes. But on the other hand, the people who do stick with it earn more because they've got higher skills because they have stuck with those. Uh, you know, so curriculum absolutely matters. Uh, you know, in my perspective, I'm sort of more working at a policy level, but for sure, I'm glad that smart people are working hard on curriculum. Thank you. I'm not sure if this is fair, but I'm sure right. you know more than most people in this room on this. What are the better education systems in the world and what can we learn from them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, people are sort of right now jealous of places like Finland and um, I, some people are jealous of Korea um, and Japan, places like that, you know, that uh, sort of outscore us on these national tests and, uh, you know, oftentimes spend less, less than us. I'm not particularly enamored with uh, the cross-national comparisons for a variety of reasons. There's a lot that you sort of can't hold constant across countries. Um, but in general, um, I would say, honestly, that I wouldn't, and you, many people might disagree with this, I would not trade our education system today for any other nations today, and especially so if we include higher ed, because the United States does the higher ed better than anyone else in the, in the world. Go cats. <laughs> That's true. Why do you think the idea of private schools, what do you think of the idea that private schools that provide competition but are not too expensive, either by means of donations or by work programs that enable students to pay for their tuition. Is this feasible? Yes, at least for a time. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, if these schools are requiring private donations, you know, you'll see them sort of take off for a little bit of time and then when the donations uh, go away, they fold. You know, so really, sort of think about a long-term solution for any of these things. It's got to be self-sustaining, and it's got to be self-sustaining internally. But in the meantime, you know, some infusion from, from philanthropy, I think, makes a lot of sense. What research shows that pumping money into schools through Title I will help students through this, though, I'm having a little trouble here, though this extra money and access to technology, through, apparently through this excess money and access to technology for education. You mentioned that increased spending does not equal better performance. Uh, it doesn't necessarily equal better performance, for sure. Uh, now, there, sort of the best research on Title I, which is this you know, federal funding for, um, that goes to schools that have low-income kids, does indicate that it's made a difference. No question, it's, um, it's a Cassio, Reber, and um, Gordon paper in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. Now, the second part of the question was about technology, and I think the book, the, uh, uh, the question is still wide open on whether technology is going to be worth the price that we pay for it. He's gonna go through every one, I like it, yeah. Not every one, almost. <laughs> Well, we're to, doing them quick. To what extent are the problems you've identified influenced by property taxes as a funding mechanism? I mean, that is why uh, we have such disparities in, uh, in spending, uh, you know, for sure. And that's why uh, states have had to come in and, just, you know, redistribute um, across, across property taxes. But I, I don't think there's a better solution. That's, and I think it's the one we got. Little is said about NCLB in schools, how all the emphasis is on the common core. What impact do you project from the latter? Um, the switch to the common core? Yes. You know, I think that many of the problems with the incentives are still there under common core. Now what we've done is increase the threshold because we've made the standards higher and harder. Um, 
you know, still there's very little about sort of rewarding people th um, moving up throughout the distribution. So I think a sort of a main upside is that we're going to see uh, fewer high achieving kids uh, sort of systematically ignored um, in, in these classrooms. But I think really the fundamental problems with No Child Left Behind are largely left unchanged under the Common Core because they have not reauthorized the ESEA. Is there a potential danger for increased incentive spending to trap low income and low performing schools in, uh, in poverty as schools and are never able to achieve the expected results? Um, you know, so does incentive spending particularly cause that? I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Although, of course, the design of you know any sort of teacher incentive payment is going to really matter a lot, and that is a policy that I would argue is not ready for prime time. We need to do a lot more testing, experimenting with, you know, sort of, you know, how do we how do we do this before we, you know, are ready to do anything sort of at a major scale, even at a statewide scale. The emphasis on the effect of merit-based incentives seems to presuppose that public school teachers are mediocre and would be more motivated to work harder with pay increases. Can you defend or refute that statement based on your research? Oh, sure. Um, you know, people, human being people respond to incentives. Um, that is, uh, you know, we see that sort of over and over, um, you know, in pay for all sorts of, of different, different areas. And I think there has been this sort of historic idea that because teachers are, uh, sort of more socially motivated than your average worker, and they are, and the, you know, and probably better human beings than the average person, and they probably are, are that too, that they are somehow um, unable to be influenced by, by bonuses. But the evidence does not suggest that, that, that that's true. Now, of course, I also want to take issue with um, you know, saying that most teachers are mediocre. I don't think that that's accurate at all. I think the main point is that there's a distribution in teacher quality, and what we want to figure out is can we get more of those high quality, or highest quality teachers into the classroom? What is it going to take to do that? Thank you. I have one last question. Okay. At the school where your children go or will go, how would you assess or do you assess the quality of teachers? Can you assess them? Do you have any thoughts? Oh, I have lots of thoughts. <laughs> um, we have been extremely fortunate to have, uh, you know, so my, our oldest is a first grader this year, and uh, he has an excellent teacher. And I can tell he has an excellent teacher for a lot of reasons. He comes home, he loves learning. Uh, he talks about school. She sends me emails um, one day saying, you know, I'm concerned that he's still making his lower cage H's backwards, and we really need to partner to figure out why that is. And the next day, she sends me a picture of his art project where he talks about how um, his best friend is worth more to him than gold, right? So I think, you know, she is sort of the total package where she's really greatly able to um, teach reading and math but she's also able to sort of address the whole person. I've seen her in action. I could never do her job half as well as she could, and I'm blessed that we have her, and I hope the, my, our next two kids have her too. Does she have grit? She has, Can she teach grit? I, I guess that, you know, leaves to be, to be seen. Hard to say. Yeah. Professor Shansenbach, thank you very much. It's been a thank delight you. for me.